The text this morning is 1 Samuel chapter 3. These are the words of God. And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. And it came to pass at that time, when Eli was laid down in his place, and his eyes began to wax dim, that he could not see. And ere the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was, and Samuel was laid down to sleep, that the Lord called Samuel, and he answered, Here am I. And he ran to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou callest me. And he said, I called not. Lie down again. And he went and lay down. And the Lord called yet again, Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And he answered, I called not, my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. And he arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And Eli perceived that the Lord had called the child. Therefore Eli said unto Samuel, Go, lie down, and it shall be, if he call thee, that thou shalt say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And the Lord came and stood and called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel answered, Speak, for thy servant heareth. And the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I will do a thing in Israel, at which both the ears of every one that heareth it shall tingle. In that day I will perform against Eli all things which I have spoken concerning his house. When I begin, I will also make an end. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knoweth, because his sons made themselves vile, and he restrained them not. And therefore I have sworn unto the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be purged with sacrifice nor offering forever. And Samuel lay until morning, and opened the doors of the house of the Lord. And Samuel feared to show Eli the vision. Then Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. And he answered, Here am I. And he said, What is the thing that the Lord has said unto thee? I pray thee, hide it not from me. God do so to thee, and more also, if thou hide anything from me of all the things that he said unto thee. And Samuel told him every whit, and hid nothing from him. And he said, It is the Lord, let him do what seemeth him good. And Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and did, did let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan even to Beersheba, Beersheba, knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord appeared again in Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. Let's pray together. Father of this book, Father of heaven, we ask you to teach us from this book that you've clearly intended for us to have. You would not have given inspired utterance to so many of your servants over the years if you'd not wanted your servants today to be blessed by it. Open this book up, we pray. In Jesus' name we pray, and amen. amen. Because of how the book of Samuel has been structured up to this point, as we've considered, we are expecting the rise of Samuel, and we are expecting the fall of the house of Eli. We expect Samuel's house to rise, and we expect Eli's house to fall. Eli himself warned his sons about this. And a prophet, an unnamed prophet, had come to Eli and had warned Eli about it. And now the word of the Lord comes to Samuel for the very first time, and the first prophetic utterance that God gives to Samuel is this word of judgment for the house of Eli, the same message. This is the third time. Eli spoke to his sons, a prophet spoke to Eli, and now a second prophet named Samuel speaks to Eli. The word of the Lord, we're told, was rare in those days, and perhaps one of the reasons why the word of the Lord was rare is why it's rare in other eras is because those who speak it get into trouble. Eli had been a father to Samuel. Remember that Hannah had brought Samuel up. He'd grown up in the precincts of the, of the um, ta tabernacle at Shiloh. Eli had been his acting father. Eli had been the one who brought him up. And the first prophetic message that God gives to Samuel is a message of severe judgment on the house of Eli. Prophets have to say hard things. False prophets love to prophesy smooth things but a real prophet has to speak the truth. And Samuel begins his career as a prophet, speaking the truth in a hard situation, in a hard way, to a man who was no doubt dear to him. So we have the house of Eli 
descending, the house of Samuel arising. And we considered last time, this is a great reversal. This is, this is what uh, Hannah talked about. We, remember, it's not an egalitarian leveling. God's not bulldozing the place. You have some rising and some falling. It's a great reversal. Uh, our Lord's mother, Mary, speaks the same way in her great Magnificat. It's a reversal. The powerful fall, the poor lifted up. That's what's happening here. We're expecting, we're anticipating this reversal. Eli raised two worthless sons. But we also have to recall that he is the one who brought up Samuel, a very worthwhile um, son of Israel. Eli raised two worthless sons, but he also brought up Samuel. It says in verse 1 that Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. In other words, he was under Eli's tutelage. Eli taught him. And we see in this passage how Eli teaches him how to hear the word of the Lord. He, uh, Eli instructs him. Uh, Samuel doesn't know the voice of the Lord. Eli knows, recognizes that it must be the Lord, and he teaches him how to hear the Lord's word, how to respond to the Lord's summoning. This was an era in which there was a drought of prophetic utterance, there was no open vision, it says in verse 2. There was no open vision. So it was that Eli lay down to sleep, and he could not see, it says in verse 3. Now, this is significant. It's clearly speaking of nighttime. Uh, it's, it's the evening, it's nighttime, and Eli couldn't see for that reason. But it provides an apt metaphor as well. We're going to consider next week when we look at the next chapter in Samuel that it, it says again that Eli's eye was dimmed. And, and this is a, an echo. This is a reminder. This is um, bouncing off of what it says at the end of Deuteronomy about Moses. Moses, it says, was 120. And it says his eye was not dim, nor his strength abated. Eli here is being the anti-Moses. Eli here is being unlike Moses. Moses had his strength with him to the end. Moses would not have been, uh, Moses would not have had trouble restraining Hophni and Phinehas the way Eli had trouble. He had his strength with him. And Moses could see. Eli could not see. And this is a real trouble because this, when the seers can't see, when the prophets can't prophesy, when the people who are entrusted with the word of God don't speak the word of God, where are you? So Eli could not see. Um, it was nighttime, but this is a metaphor for Eli's inability generally. Samuel was sleeping inside the sanctuary where the Ark of the Covenant was. So this is not the later layout that you had. This is not what you had in the tabernacle in the wilderness where you had the Holy of Holies um, or in the temple later. Samuel is sleeping inside the sanctuary where the Ark of the Covenant was, and he was sleeping, uh, it, and it says that this occurs before the lamps went out, and it's uh, quite possibly early morning. So Samuel was sleeping, verse 3. The Lord called to Samuel, who thought it was Eli. So the Lord spoke to Samuel, and Samuel thought it was Eli calling him. So he goes and responds and says, uh, what do you want? And, and Eli says, I didn't call you. So that's verses 4 and 5. The same thing happens again, verse 6. All right, the, uh, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel goes to Eli, thinking it's Eli, and Eli says, no, it wasn't me. We are then told why Samuel was making this mistake. He did not yet know the Lord, verse 7. We're going to consider that uh, more in a moment. Samuel did not yet know the Lord, because you recall it says earlier that Hophni and Phinehas did not know the Lord when it calls them sons of Belial. But this is a different situation. When this happened for the third time, Eli realized that the Lord was calling Samuel, and so he told him what to do. Eli instructed Samuel on how to hear the word of the Lord, verses 8 and 9. Now, this is, um, let me just tell you something about um, ancient story structures that continue down to the... Uh, this is an effective form of storytelling, um, and we see it happen down to the present. It's a panel, it's sort of a panel story. So uh, we've talked about chiasms, how you work down to the hinge, and that's the main point. But you also have panel stories, like uh, 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 Samuel hears the voice, and he goes to Eli the first time, then it happens again, he goes to Eli the second time, then he goes a third time. You have Jesus telling the story of the prodigal, uh, the, uh, 
uh, the Good Samaritan, where the guy's beat up, and then one guy passes by, and then another guy passes by, and then the third person comes. When you have the, sa- the, you have the setup, and then one thing happens, and then another thing happens, and then the third thing happens. Here you've got three, and then the fourth um, event is a different event. This is a panel structure for stories. Yeah, and this is one of the reasons why uh, some... Uh, those of your kids who really love that the book, The Little Engine That Could, uh, the, the reason that book works is because it, uh, it has this structure. There's something in the human, um, human heart, human mind that loves to, that kind of repetition, where one thing happens, then another thing happens, then another thing happens, then you have the resolution. Here, you have three callings which Samuel does not recognize. The third one, Eli tells him this is what's going on. And so Samuel goes and does what Eli tells him to do. So the Lord came a fourth time, and Samuel did just as Eli instructed. So notice that Hophni and Phinehas are disobedient sons. Samuel is obedient. Right? Samuel comes when he thinks Eli's calling him. He comes running. He's faithful. He's working. He's there. Uh, and then when Eli tells him what to do, he goes and he does it. All right, so Samuel did as Eli instructed. This time, it says the Lord came and stood. The thing that's uh, interesting about this is Samuel saw the Lord. This is not, this is not just hearing voices. This is not just an audible message, the word of the Lord came. It says the Lord came and stood. The Lord gave Samuel a message of severe judgment, one that would make the ears of everyone who heard it tingle. Verse 11, the Lord would lay waste to the house of Eli and finish it off. Verse 12, God says, I'm not going to hold back. The Lord says that he warned Eli about his failure to restrain his sons who made themselves vile. His sons made themselves vile. The Lord warned him, and Eli still did nothing. The sin committed cannot be addressed by sacrifice, but only by judgment. Verse 14. Then Samuel lay, presumably awake, until the morning. He's still very young. He opened the doors of the house of the Lord. He was afraid to tell Eli what the message was. He's thinking the prophetic office is not all that it's cracked up to be. The first first thing that I'm told to tell someone is I've got to tell someone who's dear to me that he has angered the Lord greatly. But Eli called to Samuel. Eli calls to Samuel, just as the Lord had done, and just as uh, Samuel thought that Eli had done. So Eli calls to um, Samuel this time, and Samuel responds and comes. And note that Eli already knows, right? Eli, wh- why would you, uh, you know, why wouldn't Eli think, well, the Lord came down and spoke to Samuel, and he must have told him a bunch of happy things. No, Eli calls Samuel and he charges him. May the Lord do a whole lot worse to you if you don't tell me everything that the Lord said. Samuel is afraid to tell Eli, and Eli knows that, that there's something, that there's bad news. Eli recognizes it as bad news before he hears any of the bad news. He had heard, he, he knew that he had this ominous dread. Uh, the previous prophet had spoken to him, and so Eli charges Samuel solemnly to tell him everything and to not hold back, verse 17. And so Samuel tells him, and it appears that Eli responds well. He is the Lord, let him do as he pleases, verse 18. Well, that's, I think, an appearance. I don't think that that's uh, how we ought to read it. We'll consider that in a moment. So Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him. Not one of Samuel's words fell to the ground, verse 19. A prophet was reestablished in Israel. A prophet with integrity was reestablished in Israel. And marvel of marvels, this prophet was reestablished in Israel at Shiloh. All right, Shiloh is this corrupt center of worship. Shiloh is this awful place. People are not sacrificing there because they know how terrible Hophni and Phinehas are. The whole system is rigged. The whole system is corrupt. The priests are aggrandizing to themselves and so on. And then God establishes a true prophetic ministry at Shiloh. God is not predictable. God is always consistent, but never predictable. All Israel, from Dan, to, from Dan to Beersheba, knew that Samuel had been established as a prophet. Verse 20, the prophetic word came again to Shiloh through 
the ministry of Samuel. Verse 21. All right, so the text tells us that Samuel did not know the Lord in verse 7. Samuel did not know the Lord. Now, as I mentioned a moment ago, the sons of Eli did not know the Lord either, but theirs was a moral problem. With Samuel, the issue was vocational. He did not know the Lord the way a prophet would. Right, so it, this is not setting up um, Hophni and Phinehas and Samuel in, as parallel instances, but rather another contrast. They did not know the Lord because they were wicked and corrupt. Samuel did not know the Lord because he was innocent and young. All right, so Samuel was inexperienced vocationally. He did not recognize his prophetic vocation yet. He didn't know the Lord that way. He was innocent and young. Hophni and Phinehas were corrupt and older. It says um, um, we know that they were older because um, Eli dies when he's 98, and uh, he'd, he'd served in his capacity for 40 years. Uh, for 40 years. So the, his sons must have been not, not, uh, not very young. So Samuel is being established as a prophet here. He's being established as a prophet. The sons of Eli are in the process of being thrown down from their office. Samuel is coming up into his office. Moreover, we are, we are told that Samuel had come to know the Lord in quite a remarkable way, like Moses had. The Lord calls him three times, and the fourth time it says that the Lord came and stood and called as before. Verse 10, the Lord came. So when Samuel says, here am I, I'm, your servant hears, it says the Lord came, it says the Lord stood, and it says the Lord spoke. Samuel saw. A few verses later, in verse 15, uh, it's called a vision. All right, a vision is something you see. And Samuel lay until morning and opened the doors of the house of the Lord. And Samuel feared to show Eli the vision. Also, note in verse 1, And the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. This is an Old Testament theophany. Um, theophany is a word that means an appearance of God. So you, you see them, in, for example, in the, uh, in the Garden of Eden story. The Lord would come and walk in the garden. It's a, um, the angel of the Lord frequently throughout the Old Testament is a manifestation of the Lord's presence that you could see. All right, so this is not, not what we have in Jesus of Nazareth, who is an incarnation. It, it, the incarnation is not the Son of God becoming visible, because the Son of God, the Word of God, the way God appears in the Old Testament, he becomes visible throughout the Old Testament, numerous instances, when Jacob wrestles with the angel of the Lord, and it says later that he's, he recognizes that he's dealt with God. It's the angel of the Lord. The Lord comes to Abraham with two angels on the way to the destruction of Sodom, and Abraham feeds them, and it's the Lord he's dealing with. These are Old Testament theophanies. In the Old Testament, the Lord does not, be, it, w w the difference is this. In the Old Testament, God is made manifest, God becomes visible, but he does not become a man. It's, an, it's a manifestation. In the New Testament, the, the word of God, Jesus, becomes a man. The incarnation was permanent. Jesus Christ is still a man, a, our elder brother. He is one of us. He is our high priest representing us permanently forever before, uh, before God, from the right hand of God. Before the incarnation happened, God came down and appeared in different instances. He dealt with Moses in this sort of appearance. Moses wanted to see him in his full glory, which God denied him and just let him see the back of his glory. But there are manifestations and theophanies of the Lord, and this is one of them. The chapter concludes with the Lord appearing again in Shiloh. This is a place already condemned. It's already under judgment. The Lord appears there, and he reveals himself to Samuel in Shiloh. Now, Samuel is spared from after Shiloh is destroyed. We see Samuel ministering elsewhere later. He, he's ministering from his hometown of Ramah uh, later after Shiloh is destroyed. But God's grace appears in Shiloh, in the person of Samuel, through the ministry of Samuel. Well, what is the message that Samuel gives to Eli? One writer has aptly said that the God of the Bible is no buttercup. 
The God of the Bible is no buttercup. He promises such a severe judgment that the mere news of it will astonish those who hear it. We see that in verse 11. We also see that expression, their ears will tingle, in 2 Kings 21, 12, Jeremiah 19, 3. When news of disaster hits, this is the, this is the metaphor, this is the image that the Bible uses. The, their ears will tingle when they hear about it. They, it means it's going to take your breath away. It's such an astonishing thing. When God judges the earth, he does not mess around. When God judges the earth, he doesn't mess around. Our lives are in his hands. Those who live in the times of the new covenant need to understand that to whom much is given, much is required. The abundance of grace, which we do have in the time of the new covenant, ought not to make us complacent. Grace is not slackness. Right? Equating grace, God is grace, thinking that God is gracious, if you think that that means that God is slacking, that God is letting boys be boys, that God is just saying, well, let's lower the bar some. That's not grace. Grace is something that liberates us from sin. It's not something that allows us to continue in sin. And as soon as we think that grace equips us to continue in sin, uh, then we have inverted the picture totally. The abundance of grace which we have ought not to make us complacent, but rather it ought to make us tremble. Work out your salvation, Paul says in Philippians, with fear and trembling. If we don't fear God in, in the grace that we've received, we're not understanding the grace of God. Work out your salvation. If you say, well, if it's, if it's salvation that I have, why should I tremble? Well, you, uh, perfect love, it says in 1 John, perfect love casts out fear because fear has to do with punishment. You don't fear God because you think he's going to uh, squash you in any, any minute. You don't fear God that way. You don't fear God because you know that he's going to be hard on you. You fear God because you know who he is and that he's being good to you. You know who he is. He spoke the creation into existence. He spoke the galaxies into existence. He became a man, died on the cross. He became a man, died on the cross to secure your salvation. When you understand who he is and who you are, and you see that he's being kind to you, what should that make you do? It should make you tremble. That's, that's a godly trembling. It's a good trembling. It's a, it's a wholesome trembling. It's not fear having to do with, oh, God hates me, I'm just a bag of dirt. That's not, that's, that kind of thinking is alien to, uh, to the Christian life. But the casual, breezy hands in your pockets stroll into heaven like you owned the place, that's alien to the Christian understanding as well. Judgment of God's covenant people is judgment for despising his grace. All right? That's what judgment is. When God judges his covenant people, Hophni and Phinehas were laboring in the place of grace. They were laboring at the place where the sacrifices were offered. They were laboring in the place where God dealt with the sins of his people. And they were abusing it. They were despising grace. And that's why the judgment is so severe. Judgment of God's covenant people is judgment for despising grace. And if we have a lot of grace, and that means we have a lot to despise, if we despise it, to whom much is given, much is required. Do not be high-minded, Paul says in Romans 11, but rather fear. Again, this is not fearing in the sense of God hates me, God despises me, but this is fear because we know who he is and we know who we are and we know that he's be he is being kind to us. So, grace is not being, sl gracious, being gracious does not mean being slack. Well, let's consider Eli's response for a moment. Eli appears to accept the prophetic word brought by Sam Samuel. He says, he is the Lord, let him do as seems good. He is the Lord, let him do what he appears to think is good. But this acquiescence is not the same thing as real submission. This acquiescence is not the same thing as real submission. Eli, I think if we consider the whole story that's told of him, Eli appears to be a good man, but deeply flawed. A good man, but deeply flawed. How so? The appropriate response would have been to take the word of the Lord and immediately restrain his sons. Why, why does he just sit there? 
the prophet, uh, uh, an unnamed prophet came earlier and prophesied, this is what's going to happen. Why didn't Eli do something then? God does not give us these messages because there is an inexorable, uh, an inexorable reality coming. God gives us messages, warnings like this, so that we might turn and repent. God says that his sin was in not restraining his sons. He told them that before, and he tells them that now. Why didn't Eli restrain his sons after the first message? Eli acquiesces to his sons, and he's doing the same thing with God. Eli is, uh, doesn't like what his sons are doing, just as like he doesn't like what God is saying. But he just lets it ride. He's acquiescing. That's not the same thing as obeying. When the word of God comes to you, repentance often causes God to relent. When the word of God comes to you, repentance often causes God to relent. Now, don't, don't get so wound up tight with your doctrines of God's sovereignty that you set aside the plain teaching of the Bible. God works out the math. We know that God is completely and exhaustively sovereign over every element of human existence. We know that the hairs of our head are numbered. We know that not a sparrow falls to the ground apart from the will of the, of the Father. We know that God numbers the blades of grass on this planet. He knows the number of molecules in the planet Jupiter, and he knows their current position and velocity, and he knows where they're going to be 10 years from now. God encompasses all things. God is absolutely sovereign. And the absolutely sovereign God tells us what he's going to do so that we could respond to him. He doesn't tell us what he's going to do so that we would act like some character in a, in a Greek tragedy, just assuming that this is fate. We are Calvinists, not fatalists. Calvinists understand that God interacts with the world in such a way, this, this means his sovereignty goes much, uh, God is not just a muscle-bound Zeus where he's making everything happen in a certain way and there's nothing we can do about it. God's sovereignty is over all, but he's, he's greater than that, bigger than that. If, think of it this way. If you, if you have this ocean of being, this great ocean of being, and God is the whale in this ocean, and we're all the little um, minnows, or we're the krill, right? Um, and the whale eats the krill. The, if, if the universe, if all that is, encompasses God, if God's a subset of this, then God can only make you do things by being a bully. God, if God comes up to you and pushes you, his action displaces your freedom. But it's not like that. The relationship that God has to this universe is the relationship that Shakespeare has to the play that he's writing. And the more, God, more Shakespeare writes the play, the longer the play gets, the freer the characters in the play are. It's not that there's a mystery, there's a paradox here, but there's not a contradiction God is sovereign over a world in which human agents are free and responsible. Charles Spurgeon, the great Calvinist minister, was once asked, how do you reconcile God's sovereignty and human freedom? And he said, well, I, I never reconcile them. I never reconcile friends. Friends don't need to be reconciled. God's sovereignty is not at odds with our responsibility to be to be obedient, to be responsive to what God says. There's not a tension. We're not squaring the circle. Now, there is a paradox here. Think of it this way. When we add, God, God is not a creature that can be counted along with the rest of us. It's not Henry and George and God, right? It's not like that. If you put God and the universe side by side and added them up, you wouldn't get two. Because the universe does not exist apart from God. God creatively speaks it all into existence, and God's authority over it is not something that drags him down into it. He's not encompassed by this. He does enter it in the person of Jesus, but he doesn't come down into it in order to be considered by us as a Zeus, who when he says, oh, uh, this is going to happen, then we have to say, okay, that's the way it's going to be. This is Eli's mistake. When God speaks to the inhabitants of Nineveh, they knew better. Jonah comes and says, yet 40 days and this city will be destroyed. And what do they do? If they had responded like Eli, he is the Lord, let him do as seems good to him, Nineveh would have been destroyed. But they didn't respond that way. They repented. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the wilderness. 
See, that's when God speaks to us, he speaks to us as someone who expects us to respond to what he's saying. We're not supposed to respond to the theology of the thing. We're supposed to respond to him. Do you see that? He speaks the word, and we should respond to what he says and let him work out the math. Let him work out the creator-creature distinction. That's his job. That's his department. So when he comes down to Eli and says, your sons are being vile, Eli doesn't have to figure out the theology of God's sovereignty. Eli has to figure out what to do with his sons. That's the issue. So when God speaks, when, uh, think of, uh, uh, look at 2 Corinthians. Second Corinthians seven. Paul had rebuked the Corinthians. I'll start at verse nine. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. For you were made sorry after a good godly manner, that you might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. For behold, this selfsame thing, that you sorrowed, sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness is wrought in you, yea, what clearing of yourselves, yea, what indignation, yea, what fear, yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge, in all things ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Paul had rebuked the Corinthians, and they hustled to put it right. Paul had rebuked them, and they hustled. They responded, as Eli should have done. Eli should have done done more with his sons than just say, tut, tut, you know, it's not a good thing that I hear about you. And then in the, verse, in the pre verse prior, in verse 10, for godly sorrow produces repentance without regret. As another translation says, there is a way to be sorrowful for sin. You're sorry, you're sorry about your sin, and then you're sorry the next day, and then you're sorry the next day after that. You're sorry about your sins, same sin, and maybe a little few more. Then you're sorry the next day, and it doesn't produce repentance without regret. It's sorry for sin, sorry for sin, sorry for sin, and you die sorry. You can die sorry for sin, but repentance produces a turning. Repentance turns away. The word for repentance means a change of mind. It's a change of heart. And the word of God came to Eli and gave him an opportunity. An opportunity was set right before him to do what was right. And he, although he, he was, I think, clearly a servant of God who taught Samuel certain good things and who cared for Samuel and who spoke the word of God to Hannah, we see a number of things that are valuable in what Eli did. But we also see the deep flaws. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as it says to the Jews in the wilderness. Do not put it off. Obedience can only occur in the present. Apathy is not repentance. Acquiescence is not repentance. He is the Lord, let him do whatever, is not repentance. Repentance is zealous. Repentance goes. Repentance acts. Repentance resolves. It produces godly repentance without regret. You turn away, you find yourself in another place. Repentance involves change. Think of, uh, just get your minds around that. Repentance involves change. Not absolute change, not change in an instant, not change where you're all of a sudden you're a perfectionist and you're up in heaven, but it involves substantive, real change now. It doesn't mean manana. It means now. So when the word of God comes to you today, if you hear his voice, do not harden. Obedience can only happen in the present. Now that the canon of Scripture has been closed, one aspect of the prophetic office has also been completed and closed. No one will arise in the church today to be a new Jeremiah, or a new Isaiah, or a new Samuel, or even a new Agabus, a New Testament, New Covenant uh, prophet that we find in the book of Acts. The library is completed. The word of God is complete. There will be no, we're not going to have the Bible part two. We're not going to have anything to glue in the back of our Bibles. There are no new messages. So when someone stands up and says, thus saith the Lord today, you should be looking around and say, all right, we prepared to execute them if, they, if it comes, if it's not true. As it says in Deuteronomy uh, 13, you're not supposed to 
uh, a, a prophet should not, must not take you after other gods. Deuteronomy 18, what he says must come true. Oftentimes what people do who believe that the prophetic gift is being exercised today are what, what they're assuming is that God has not completed his library. God has not completed his revelation. They're assuming that the canon of Scripture is not complete. And those who believe that prophetic utterance can happen today really ought to be taking notes and ought to be publishing volume 2, volume 3. If, if the Lord really, if someone says, thus saith the Lord, I mean, really? Is this God talking? Why aren't you taking better notes? Why aren't we recording this? Why aren't we having it transcribed? If someone says, thus saith the Lord, you can't then say, well, I didn't really mean that, really. I have a friend many years ago in his, the wild and woolly days of his ministry. He was in a, a meeting where it was, they were having a good time, and, and someone stood up and prophesied. Thus saith the Lord, and he gave a message. And then a few minutes later, uh, my friend was very grateful that he was not managing this meeting. He was not ministering over this meeting. Someone else stood up on the other side and said, thus saith the Lord. That was not me. <laughs> A minute later, someone stood up on this side. Thus saith the Lord. Oh, yes, it was. <laughs> now, now we, have to, we have to understand that when God speaks, we need to treat it as though God spoke. And if we treat it as God spoke, then we have to treat it as Scripture. We have to treat it with the full authority of Scripture if God really said it. If you're not treating it with the authority of Scripture, then you're really admitting that you don't think that God really said it. Nevertheless, this is, and this is the important thing, one of the things that uh, you obviously understand that in the charismatic movement there are those sorts of excesses and have been those sorts of excesses. But in our tradition, there is a similar kind of excess. And that is, we want everything safely in the library and all the books closed and shelved properly and cataloged and put in the right spot in the library. But we don't want the Word of God to speak prophetically today. We, because that's dangerous. That messes our hair up. That makes us change. That makes us do things. That, and we want, we want to have it all de done decently and in order. The fact that the canon of Scripture is closed does not mean that God is done with prophets. That it does not mean that the gift of prophecy has vanished. It means one element in the gift of prophecy has vanished. There are two basic elements in prophecy. One is foretelling, speaking the future, speaking under inspiration, and proving that you're speaking under inspiration by, by being able to... Uh, tell the future and prove to everyone that you are being inspired by the God who controls all history. That foretelling is one element of prophecy that is completed with the canon. There's no inspiration today that way. However, there's another element of prophecy, and that's forthtelling. That's telling the people of God what the Word of God says. So God is not done with prophets in that sense. And those who say, the canon is closed, the library is closed, let's, let's put this book in a locked box, let's study it, memorize it, and put it away. Let's not let it get at us. That is, that's sort of a, a mentality exhibited by museum curators. That what they, uh, they, they don't want the Word of God to be understood as living and active, as powerful as a two-edged sword. The Word of God did not cease to be living and active after the library was completed. God expects his prophets to prophesy today. The Puritans used to rightly identify the preaching of the word as an exercise of the gift of prophecy. A great Puritan writer, William Perkins, wrote a book on preaching called The Art of Prophesying. It was a book on preaching. Now today, we wouldn't dream of calling uh, uh, seminaries a, a school of the prophets. But that's what they are. John Knox was nothing if not a prophet. The words of God are still declared today. But in a time of no open vision, as it was before Samuel's rise, those words fall to the ground. These words can fall to the ground when they're spoken in unbelief, when they're spoken heretically, when they're spoken with timidity, when God establishes a prophetic word, all of Israel knows it. From Dan to Beersheba, all Israel knows it. The words go forth, as Isaiah says, to accomplish what God intended for it. 
God's, God's word does not return void. When this happens, the people of God hear and heed. Our name for this is Reformation and Revival. This is what we're praying for. Think of it this way. Jesus came and he spoke with authority, not as the scribes. It says, Jesus spoke with authority and not as the scribes. He didn't come as the librarian. He didn't come as a cataloger of books. He didn't come as one of these people who cough in ink. He didn't come as someone who was going to fuss over every detail. He, he came as one who spoke with authority and not as the scribes. But we get, we get all gummed up in this. We either think it's got to be authoritative, no constraints, or all constraint, no authority. It's like having, a, and, and different wings of the church, air in this way. Our charismatic brothers know that there's supposed to be a fire. Right? You've got a fireplace and a fire. They know, there's, they know about the fire. They, they build the fires on the coffee table and on the sofa and on the carpet. And but at least they know there's supposed to be a fire. And we've got this mantelpiece, a decorated mantelpiece, ancient mantelpiece, confessional mantelpiece, uh, questions from the catechism inscribed on it. And we spend all our time polishing the mantelpiece. We've got a form and a structure. We've got ev everything we need except for the fire. Right? The mantelpiece, the fireplace is supposed to have a fire in it. Would that God would have mercy on his church and get the Christians with the fire over to where there's a fireplace and get the people with fireplaces and chimneys to be willing to have them. What we want is God to move in such a way that reformation and revival happens. Now you can tell when someone is speaking the word of God, you're going to have this basic distinction between false teachers and true, a basic distinction between false prophets and true. And this is what the distinction is. True prophets, true preachers, true ministers love the world without trusting it. They love the world without trusting it. False teachers trust the world without loving it. That's the difference. There are people who take all their signals from the world, whatever the world says. They trust the world. Whatever the world says, whatever scholarship says, whatever the fashions are, fashions are nothing but uh, mild temporary insanities. Whatever the current, the current thing is, they, they trust it. They take it. They take it in. But then they, everything is jaded. Everything is twisted. Everything is bent. Everything is faded. Nothing tastes. They can't love the world. They trust the world. They trust the world in everything it tells them to do. They trust the world, and they trust their own wisdom. They trust their own thoughts. They trust their own hearts. They trust everything about themselves, but they don't love. As a consequence, they, they're listening to an idolatrous word, and they can't love. Nothing tastes. Christians can love the world and everything in it, every butterfly, every blade of grass, all the God, every meal, all God's gifts. We can love the world, but we don't trust it. We trust God. We trust Jesus. That's what we're called to do. And this is what God has given us the ability to do by his gospel in his grace. Our Father, we confess that in our day, just as in Samuel's, there's a clear lack of prophetic utterance. We pray that you would be pleased to send your spirit upon your church in order to reestablish the recognized authority of your word among your people. Help us to hear and to believe, we pray. As we pray, we offer back to you the words that the Lord Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Those of you in this room who are struggling with various temptations and sins, and that would be all of you, all of us, all of us are dealing with these things. We need to be careful to be not discouraged by the words of the gospel, not to get it upside down. Think of it this way. Jesus cannot be manipulated by sinners. Jesus cannot be worked by sinners. Jesus cannot be outwitted by sinners. Jesus cannot be twisted, bent, turned around by sinners. But Jesus is a friend to sinners. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us an everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work.